Welcome. Well, we thank you for joining us from the ATL. Well, I've got a room full here at Belma Jackson High School, and we're recording this for our friends at Rosa Scott, Germantown, okay. High School, and Ridgeland High School. So we're all of our ninth graders and Madison County students uh, hearing about the manufacturing career, club, all the great things you guys do with Joaquin Martin, and kind of the, uh, you know, you're more on the engineering side, but there is a, the manufacturing, uh, for what, you know, I'm obviously a novice, the manufacturing process has a long, long line of steps, and it's important to realize that there's a lot of great careers at all, all at all areas of it from the start to the beginning. Um, so yeah. uh, we do have some great questions we're going to get to from the students, but we'd love to hear about your background and uh, how you got in with Lockheed Martin and uh, kind of what you do and uh, and how that plays a part in the manufacturing process. All right. Good. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as I mentioned to Mr. Cougar here. I do. Um, Nobody says it right. It's fine. I do. I yeah. do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I do have a coworker that probably will be popping on any second here joining us. Um, but my name is Monica McKendrick. I uh, am a systems engineer actually at Lockheed Martin um, Corporation uh, located in the Marietta, Georgia area. Um, I started um, with Lockheed um, in 2005, so it's been almost 17 years. I went in right after uh, college, um, got hired right out of school um, with them into their engineering leadership development program. Um, that program kind of allows you to um, come in and do rotations within the corporation in different areas um, of engineering and kind of find your fit. And then, um, you know, I just continued my career there. So when I first came in, I was in software. Um, kind of made the switch to systems. As Mr. Pygott mentioned, um, Lockheed Martin does do a lot of manufacturing. The location that I currently work at is an aeronautical facility, um, and we build um, C-130J uh, military planes. Um, um, so that's just a little bit about me and, and where I am right now. And Adrian did join. Um, so Adrian, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is uh, Adrian Marshall. I'm originally from Tallulah, Louisiana, which is almost about the hour <laughs> from Jackson there. Yeah, right so I go through Jackson. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So uh, go through Jackson and visit all the time. We have friends there. Uh, but that's where I grew up. Uh, went to undergraduate at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, got my electrical engineering degree uh, there. And uh, from there, I went straight to Georgia Tech. Uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia, for my master's degree in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, from there, I got my first job opportunity uh, at Warner Robins Air Force Base, uh, which is about an hour and a half south of Atlanta. And uh, there I had an opportunity to work on electronic warfare. So that equipment that helps the, the uh, pilots of the C-130 protect themselves against uh, other uh, attacks such as missiles, whether those be be uh, airborne missiles from other aircraft or ground-based missiles from the ground. Uh, so the, the electronic warfare helped protect our pilots and air crew from uh, those threats. Uh, I did that for about a year before joining Lockheed Martin. Uh, I think that was around 2006. And uh, been here ever since. It's been a great company. Uh, to work for, uh, work in Monica's group as the systems engineer and manager uh, as well. Uh, but uh, through my time here, I've done a lot of uh, great uh, programs and roles, uh, such as systems engineering and uh, proposal management, and uh, just a lot of other facets of, of what we get to do here. Uh, I think it's great because we get to work with the military men and women that serve our country every day. Uh, so you get to work on the devices that fly them around and uh, help protect them in their missions each and every day. So uh, that's a little bit about me. It's nice to uh, see you in the class there. Oh, yeah, and we're glad to have you. Um, now, one thing that you both have said that I've kind of gotten from the beginning here is that, you know, if somebody wants to be in the manufacturing field, you don't have to know. You don't have to know the welding part necessarily. You don't have to know all the IT part. You guys obviously have your own specialty. But, how, you know, every, every step of that, especially with a high-tech device like a, a Degum C-130, 
there are a lot of, uh, it's a very uh, intricate and very delicate process that has to be done. And there's a lot of, it's not just the mechanical skills. For what, I, what you guys are telling me, your background, it has the electronic skills, the IT skills, the software skills. So how important is that aspect of a manufacturing process? I think it's all very important, right? Um, especially as you come in as a manufacturing engineer and move up. So when you think of manufacturing engineering, right? You think of <clears throat> just the design of it. And um, I think trying to, that product that you're designing and trying to make it as lean as possible, right? So I think in that you're gonna need those other skills such as people skills, maybe the INT skills to possibly try to understand some of the robots and the, and the, and the software that the machines use. Um, and, and, and you made a great point that sometimes when you're coming in, you might not know all of that right after school, right? Um, one good thing about where we are, um, in my time at Lockheed, a lot of things you can learn as you go and as you take new positions, right? We have people and mentoring available, um, to help you gather the skills that you need to do your job and, um, complete the mission. Yeah, and before we before we started, we actually watched a short video on Lockheed Martin about uh, interviewing some of the employees about the skills they have, and it had assemblers, testers, um, uh, uh, supervisors. It had a, a software person. So, uh, how many other areas are in a uh, in a company like Lockheed Martin that all come together in uh, having a finished product? Oh, many, right? Um, and and not just engineering. Of course, within engineering, we have you know software, hardware, manufacturing, electrical, um, quality engineering, right? But, you know, just thinking from a company overall, you have many different functions such as, you know, finance, planning, subcontract program managers that work with our, work with our suppliers um, that we utilize. On the program Adrian and I work on, um, one thing I really like about it is that although we are in the engineering area, we work with a lot of different functions, right? So we get to understand um, the program management side of things. We get to understand the finance portion of it, um, working with the different suppliers and managing um, their processes and integration. We do a lot of work with quality to make sure that the products that we build are, um, you know, of good quality. Um, and in that, we do a lot of work with our customer as well, making sure that the, the products that we design and build um, meet the requirements of, you know, of the customer and, and the military and, and making sure that what we build um, can actually help them in their um, warfighting missions. Now, and obviously, I mean, and we'd be remiss, you know, obviously during Black History Month, it's important, you know, it's important for us to see representation in the manufacturing career cluster because uh, 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 the classroom with me right now is 100% African-American students. So it's important for them to see uh, great black professionals in the manufacturing field. Um, and then obviously, uh, I don't, I'm, Monica, I'm not sure where you went to college, but with uh, Adrian, you going to HBCU, even though this is Jackson State and Alcorn Territory. Um, <laughs> Uh, what type of uh, what type of opportunities are there and uh, for young minorities in this area, and how important is it for them to realize that they're needed in this area? Um, I'll let Adrian take that first, and then I'll come in and plug my HBCU after he's done. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a timely question. I actually just read something the other day that uh, mentioned that HBCUs. Uh, kind of produced the majority of black engineers in the field, you know, whether that's commercial or uh, military uh, engineers. Uh, but it was it was huge for me, right? Uh, I've had an opportunity to attend an HBCU and a predominantly white university. Um, and both, you know, I think had their their unique benefits. Absolutely. Uh, at the HBCU, Absolutely. yeah. <clears throat> uh, at the HBCU. You know, I, I got a great foundation in engineering, and I felt that it was um, it was more of a family feel. So there was a lot of uh, students helping each other, right? And that was my experience. It might not have been everyone else's experience, uh, and and that helped me, uh, with, especially set that foundation for me and get my engineering tool belt uh, ready to go. Uh, when I went to Georgia Tech. I found that to be a lot different experience, not to say that it was a bad one, but it was different. Whereas it was not as much of a family field, but much more of a competitive field. And that helped, you know, 
grow me in terms of, you know, uh, there are people inside of Lockheed Martin uh, that are can be considered as competitors because they want to do a, a great job and do it better than anyone else. And obviously outside of Lockheed Martin, we're competing with other companies each and every day. Most times it's for the benefit of the country, right? And it's, it's a good thing to have healthy competition uh, because you have one company competing with another company to make a superior product. And ultimately that benefits our country and our uh in our uh, war fighters in the field. I uh, know getting a little bit away from it, but uh, going back to just the HBCU environment, uh, just what I would, would say to focus on, if you're not really sure if engineering is for you or what aspect of engineering is for you, uh, you can get a lot of that training uh, at HBCUs and many other colleges. Um, so don't limit yourself, but it's important to be thinking along the lines of critical thinking and communications. Uh, I wasn't necessarily a, a A student in every subject, uh, but I did get a learn a lot to get a good foundation and be able to use that with my critical thinking skills and my communication to be able to accomplish goals with uh, the people around me. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty good. Um, I did attend an HBCU as well. I went to Clark Atlanta University. Um, and I majored in um, computer science. I got actually got a bachelor's and master's from Clark Atlanta um, in computer science area. I also attended a, a predominantly white institution as well, Rollins College down in Florida, um, to get my MBA. Wow. <laughs> um, I agree with Adrian in the sense of, um, you know, coming into engineering and having that HBCU background, my experience as well was very family oriented and, and looking out for each other and helping each other. Um, I, I think that oftentimes when we're in college, we don't know what we want to do, right? You go in and you're still trying to figure it out. And to be quite honest, a lot of times we graduate and still don't know what we want to do, right? Um, I think one of, one of the things for me, I did a lot of internships in college a lot of them in the engineering field. Um, I would <clears throat> ask people to look for those opportunities. I actually did them in high school as well. We would go out, you know, a couple of weeks to different college campuses in the STEM field, right? Um, I did, you know, uh, one at Tennessee State, one at Tuskegee in the summertime during high school. Um, and that's how I knew I wanted to make it in the STEMs, right? I, I love everything science and math related. Um, so then got to college and did different internships in different um, businesses, right? Like I did one with a, co a car company, Ford, up in Detroit, worked with the EPA, different areas of engineering um, and, and, and sciences to kind of find that niche. So I would encourage people to do that um, as well throughout their college career. Now, now let me ask you this. When it comes to uh, higher education, let's say somebody doesn't have the financial means or doesn't have the quite the ACT score to get into the four-year university and they want to do the associate's path with a technical certificate, manufacturing, uh, any type of engineering. Would a company like Lockheed Martin also be looking for the tradespeople to come in and learn and, and learn those skills as well? Or is it all, is it, are all the, is this field only going to be catered toward the, uh, the university student? No, um, not at all, right? We have a lot of people, especially in the manufacturing side of the house, that do um, have like uh, associate's degrees, et cetera, from technical schools, right? And then oftentimes I know a lot of uh, four-year colleges will work with, with uh, a lot of technical schools to bring those students in so that they can continue their education. Um, but to get back to Lockheed Martin, especially on the manufacturing side and um, on the production floor area um, where a lot of these uh, jobs exist, as they're working with the with the products hands on, I do think that a lot of them come in with um, you know certifications in manufacturing um, and some of those associate degrees from technical or two year schools um, to help get them get their foot in the door. Right again, I do think it's a lot of on the job training. From there, you can continue to build upon the skills that you brought in. Uh, possibly go back to school. Right, um, a lot of I know Lockheed Martin helps um, with tuition assistance. Um, for employees, um, I would assume that a lot of companies do, right, um, offer that to their employees. So, you know, you can definitely go back and continue building upon your education from there. 
Yeah, and as Monica mentioned, like we have, you know, very diverse backgrounds and the people that work here at Lockheed Martin. You have anywhere from high school degrees to PhDs mm -hmm. uh, and everything in, in between. And, you know, it's a, a few things that I like about uh, Lockheed Martin because you have, you know, not only, not only are we building you know, aircraft, but we're building missile systems and educational tools. And it's a, a quite a large gamut of things that we do here and, and quite a bit to, you know, pique the interest of just about a lot of people. Um, but I wanted to give one example. We actually have one engineer on our team. When he started his career, he was, uh, he was providing janitorial services at a hospital and wow. he continued to work and, uh, you know, get uh, additional training and uh, did not have, uh, you know, higher education, so to speak. When he joined Lockheed Martin and through one of the programs that Monica mentioned, he started to get uh, advanced, uh, more uh, training in the field of systems engineering. And now he's one of the best engineers we have on our team. Wow. So it's, it's a lot of places you can start with Lockheed Martin and a lot of opportunities to grow uh, in different areas, if you desire to do so, not only with Lockheed Martin, but a lot of other companies as yeah. well. And Lockheed Martin in the video mentioned is that it's impossible to come into a company like Lockheed Martin and know everything that that's going on because the, uh, yeah. the product is so specialized. And I think that would be with the majority of advanced manufacturing because a specialized product, you're not just going to know that on the street. That's something you're going to have to be trained for. And you're going to have to be open to learning. You know, even if you have a degree, you still got to learn that skill on how a specific product is made. Exactly. And so a lot of the times, um, some of those skills that Adrian mentioned, right, the critical thinking, being able to communicate, um, those are things that we look for in individuals, right? Because if you have those things, typically in any environment, you can succeed, right? So we're looking for, because you're not going to know, like when I transferred to the location here in Marietta, I knew absolutely nothing about a C-130J, right? I didn't know anything about airplanes, et cetera. Um, so th that's the kind of things you're going to learn on the job. But I did have the, you know, the ability for critical thinking, communication, working with, with others well, et cetera, right, that I could apply to the job to get the job done. And that's funny you say that because uh, these kids like to moan and groan when I have when we have group projects, I assign the groups and I let them know about you don't have to be friends with people. You got to learn to work together in order to be successful professional because, you um, 99% of the people in this world do not get to pick their coworkers, but I'm, I'm glad you said that because you do have to have great communication skills and great teamwork skills. Um, but I do want to get to these questions, and these are these are all ninth graders. And the fact that they're thinking like this is incredible. Um, so I'll get to as many of these as I can. But this first one is from Donovan Harris, and he asked, what's more important in your area, working as an individual or working as a team? I um, That is a great question. I think both are important. Um, but I would say working as a team um, would be more important. Um, although we have individual tasking and assignments, um, at the end of the day, I think it's important that you're able to work with others, right? It's very few, if any, jobs I've had where it was just all about me. Um, you know, like, like I said, I had my tasking that I had to do, but it all served a bigger purpose and came together with others. Um, so definitely working in a team is more important, in my opinion. Yeah, and I would agree with that. You know, I like the, the phrase, you know, many hands make light work. And, you know, when you think about building something as, as large as an aircraft, you know, you have different specialties, you know, and I think uh, it was mentioned before that you're not an expert at everything. You have some people that specialize in electronics, some people that ex specialize in avionics or flight dynamics or materials. And it's very hard to find one person that is just an expert in all those areas. So when you're looking to bring a large project to completion and have a quality product that you can give to someone, uh, then you really need to lend on a lot of people. It provokes you know, additional thought processes and uh, ingenuity and uh, you, you tend to lean on each other and feed off of each other to get uh, far superior products. Uh, so in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we interface with internal team members, customers, suppliers, and there's, there's no way that's you know, gonna be a one-man show or one-woman show. It uh, definitely 
you know, benefits us all to be working as a team. Awesome. Uh, this is Eddie Myers, and he asked, what in, what uh, convinced you to work at Lockheed Martin? Yep, I'll start there. So <laughs> – it was it was pretty easy for me, and I think I mentioned it earlier. So I like to see a finished product uh, because one of my internships, for example, was with Texas Instruments, and they work with uh, you know micro circuits and electronics. And it was really boring to me because you were just working with like one microchip at a time. You didn't know what it was going to be used for. I couldn't see any application for it. But when you're working on a military aircraft. You work with the men and women that fly on that aircraft every day. You see it in use. You see how it's helping the country, whether it is uh, protecting us or searching to surveillance or it's putting out fires in California or refueling other aircraft. You know, you can you get to see the product that you're working on every day in action and how it's helping people. That, that's all. Uh, one thing about manufacturing that other fields don't have, you really get to see the finished product. Yep. So that's what drew me to Lockheed Martin. Yeah, I kind of agree with Adrian. I mean, I did come in right out of college. Um, so for me, the reason I chose Lockheed Martin of my other employment offers was because of the engineering leadership development program. Um, with that, I was able to come in and learn a lot, right? Like, as we mentioned, oftentimes we don't know what we're, we're going in to do. Um, so the fact that I could go into different areas of engineering, learn different things about it, and then kind of make my career from there is what is why I picked the corporation. That's awesome. Uh, now, now, this is a good question, especially coming from rural Mississippi. This is Sanaja Johnson. And she said, in your company, could you move to a different state and still be, uh, and, and, and still be doing a similar job? Yeah, I did. <laughs> like I started out in Florida, um, in Orlando, Florida. I started out with Lockheed there. Um, I was down there for five years and then I relocated. Um, I'm from Georgia, so I wanted to get back to the Georgia area and relocated with the company um, back to Georgia. And, you know, I'm still with Lockheed, um, still here. So it's definitely doable to relocate um, to a different state with the same company, doing the same thing. And we hire people all the time uh, on our team that are from other locations within Lockheed, whether it be California or York or Texas, and people from our group go to other Lockheed Martin uh, areas and do similar things, or they want to do something different. Uh, I think that's what's great about uh, our group. You have that opportunity to uh, grow within your, your field of choice, or if you want to try something different, there are many opportunities to do that within Lockheed Martin and in other states, mm -hmm. and even across the world, other countries. Uh, well, well, this is a great question. They didn't put a name on this one, but I wanted to ask this one. Uh, is that what is the hardest product, uh, hardest project you've ever had to manufacture? Hmm, that's a good one. Yeah. The hardest? You have one, Adrian? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> is that the, the, the one I'm working on now? So uh, in our field, we build simulators to help train uh, the air crew, uh, whether, you know, they're going to be a pilot or a load master to uh, deliver cargo off the back end of the aircraft or people that maintain the aircraft. So we have a particular project now that we are, we typically build our simulators from scratch, from raw materials, uh, but the customers started getting smart. They have very old aircraft that are just sitting in what they call uh, bone yards. And you think of it like a, a human graveyard where they put, uh, you know, humans that, they, that die, where they, aircraft that go to die, they take them to this uh, location called the bone yard. So they asked us to start taking these older uh, dead aircraft and bringing them back to life as training devices. You gotta be kidding. This was, yeah. <laughs> so this was the first time we had to do this as a group. Uh, so it was a real challenge, you know, one, uh, kind of refurbishing everything in the aircraft and adding new technology to it such that it's uh, operating as a brand new training device. That's hard. That sounds hard just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's been quite a challenge, but we're wow. going to deliver the few. 
Um, for me, <clears throat> I don't think mine is as difficult as Adrian's there. Um, but one of the, the customer did come to us asking, um, again, with the training devices that we build, um, most, uh, most of them are, uh, have different configurations, right? Like some pilots or, or uh, maintenance may train in like a certain configuration and then some may train in another. And they wanted devices that they could switch between both. Um, and in the past, we had constantly done just one or the other. Um, but trying to make our first reconfigurable training device was definitely interesting. Trying to make sure that you're meeting the requirements that the customer had um, and being able to turn that over in a short period of time so that we could meet the training needs of the military. I think that was probably the most difficult um, project that we had at that time. Now we're on to like our second or third one, so. Yeah. Well, I just got two more from the students and uh, this is a good one because I know uh, with the Lockheed Martin video we saw, they talked about this. This is Camaria Smith and she asked, did your thoughts on manufacturing change from the time you started at Lockheed Martin? Yeah, so I would say it, it certainly did for me, right? When I thought about manufacturing, you know, I just kind of pictured, you know, this assembly line where you just continually pump out a product. That's right? exactly Take what the, the video said. That's funny. I'll, I'll tell <laughs> yeah. you, that's funny. That's, that's what she says. <laughs> Yeah, and that's exactly what I thought about it. You, you just kind of, you know, rubber stepping just the next one out and it just continues and continues. Um, you know, being at Lockheed Martin, uh, Monica mentioned this term earlier called lean, right? Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do on a consistent basis is build products faster, safer, and uh, of course, cheaper, yeah. right? And I didn't know all the, the work in and thinking that went into that process. Uh, so when you look at our assembly line for our aircraft, uh, there became an increased need for C-130s across the world, not just in the US, but other international customers. So we used to uh, deliver 12 aircraft a month, which is about, I'm sorry, a year, which is about one a month. We had so much demand for the C-130, we had to increase their production to 24 to 30 aircraft per, per year. And more than double. Uh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about that, you can't continue to use the same processes and manufacturing uh, ideology that you've used in the past. So that was an eye-opener to me. It's like, all right, how do we go from 12 to 24, double your output in the same amount of time? And uh and the same amount of space, right? We aren't building yeah. new manufacturing floors. Same to the people. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's absolutely. That's crazy. Wow. So that was an eye opener for me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I agree. Just, you know, you try to think about, at, like Adrian, you just think of this production line. Um, but not only getting leaner, um, just the safety components of it. How can we, um, you know, kind of reduce errors, uh, make things, as he mentioned, faster? Um, and safe, right? Because you have a lot of people working things and, and you know, removing that element of ways people can get hurt um, is very important. And, and being able to think about those things and implement new processes um, and bringing those ideas to the table um, is what I gained from it over time. Uh, this is my last one from the students. This is Lakeria Luckett. And she asked, how does it feel coming from where you grew up to being to where you are now? amazing i think like <laughs> i think back to you know i'm from originally from albany georgia um it's a very small smaller city not much there um albany i love state my there, hometown though. say that again albany state is there though hbcu albany state is there um that's my second love um clark atlanta first but um <laughs> No, um, just I do like just to look back and and sometimes see, you know, um, how people can get stuck in certain elements and environments. Um, my logic is go for it, right? Like, I feel like I can always go home. I, I always have family there. I can always go back if needed. But just stepping out and taking that 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 leap of faith, um, leaving home. I left home at 17. I, have, I haven't been back to Albany to live since, right? 
um, just taking that leap of faith and going out and seeing what happens, right? And just taking chances. Um, the 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 world is big. There's many opportunities. Um, and just having that faith in myself to go out and do it. I feel like I've accomplished so much um, since I left. Um, and, and now, you know, I, I go back, I give back. I work with the kids there. Um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit there. Um, and just trying to get other people to see um, that it's so much more in the world and so many paths you can take, um, I think is important for us to do as people in general, but especially um, as, as Black people. I know you said most of your students are, are Black. Um, uh, to give back to our community. Now, everybody in the room is right now but me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh at that. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, they all laugh. <laughs> but no, I think it's important for <clears throat> for our kids to see us um, and see that we are able to go out and do great things, right, in the world. And and it's important to go back and show them that it can be done. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, just taking that leap of faith and going out and doing something different. Um, you're either going to pass or fail. And if you do fail, because failure is a part of life just dust yourself off and get back and, and try again, right? Um, and I think that's just life in general. Adrian, you yeah. have anything else? Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned earlier, uh, I was from Tallulah. If you've ever driven through there, you know that it's like one exit and if you miss it, <laughs> you just miss it. So growing up at Tallulah, you know, there was no Walmart, there was no Target, there was no Starbucks. <laughs> it's uh, Probably you had to go to Monroe. <laughs> oh yeah, Monroe or Jackson, right? If we wanted to go to the mall, we we chose between those two options. Uh, so as as Monica mentioned, I wasn't really exposed to a lot. There definitely weren't any, you know, in, what I would say, engineering firms in Tallulah. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they only aspire to hire as they can see around them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just you know, kind of limited their thoughts, like, hey, I want to be a manager at McDonald's. And that was their goal. Uh, but just getting outside of that environment uh, to where I am now, it's, it's been quite eye-opening to use Monica's term there. Uh, with Lockheed Martin, you know, we get to travel a lot, you know, across the United States and across the world. So it's great getting to see other places around the world that I, you know, never imagined that I would have visited you know, as a young kid. So uh, that part alone has been worth its weight in gold to me. And, uh, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, engineers and manufacturing engineering does pay well, right? So you get to give your kids and your family opportunities that you didn't get to experience when when I was younger. And, uh, and also, you know, to Monica's last point there, uh, it's a great feeling to, to be in a position to be able to give back to others. And that's through your time and, and resources, uh, which I think is always great. That's awesome. And, uh, and, and, and that's just, and that's great stories on, on both of your parts. And we're almost out of time. And I thank you both for, for joining us. But before we go, uh, that leads us into our last question. And that is, you know, uh, and even though Mississippi does have a very, especially this area has a great manufacturing base with, uh, we have the Nissan plant here, which is one of only two in North America. We have Kasai that makes a lot of the plastic products that Nissan uses. We have the Levi Strauss, uh, uh, the Levi Strauss company and Tyson Foods, which is one of the largest chicken, uh, the largest chicken manufacturers in the world. So with there, there are opportunities in manufacturing here, but like you said, you can expand your horizons. But everybody mm -hmm. in the world now grew up just like you did, black in the South. And the obstacles that you guys face, it's not a matter of when they're going to, if they're going to face us, when they're going to face us. And even if they have no desire to ever be in the manufacturing field or uh, advanced manufacturing or anything like that, what can they do now as 15, 16, uh, 14, 15, 16 year olds to overcome those same obstacles you guys face and become just as successful. Yeah, so I think there's a, a few things. Uh, one is, is just kind of getting these experiences similar to what you're providing them right now and uh, networking with people that have gone through uh, some of these challenges to see how they navigated those challenges, what they did to prep, prepare themselves. Uh, you know, one of the things you know, I do think this country is making strides in terms of diversity 
and you know mending you know some of those wounds that are out there but there's still a lot of work to be done so one of the things that I, I feel was a somewhat of a hindrance to me growing up because I grew up in an all black school. It's like my first, I actually uh, going to HBCU, which was mostly black. There were like a handful of other uh, ethnicities, uh, but I didn't have my first white or non-black classmate until I was in graduate school. And that was pretty, that was a real challenge for me uh, because it was, it was different in terms of networking and getting to know people and, and experiencing somebody not wanting to help me just because of the color of my skin. So you definitely want to prepare yourself to, to say, yes, you, we are progressing, but there are some people out there that have not progressed with the rest of the country and you might interface with some of them. And, um, and the more you can work to prepare yourself for that going in, the better you be prepared for that. And as I stated, you know, just kind of networking with other people that have dealt with similar challenges, which is what I had to do. I had a lot of great mentors along the way that uh, kind of gave me some some insight. So, yep, you know, you're going to experience that, but, you know, don't let that deter you. You know, keep striving, keep going. There are going to be some people that don't, that don't look like you that are on your side and there's going to be some people that look like you that are not on your side. So you just have to learn to navigate that and, and learn, you know, who you can work with and how to work with others, even when it's a challenge, uh, no matter what they look like. Yeah. And, and one thing that, that stood out to me um, that you said, Mr. Paget was it's not if it's when, and it's going to happen. Right. And just, continue as Adrian mentioned to prepare yourself as much as possible for that and don't let those things knock you down you are as deserving as everybody else um and and there are many people sometimes that will make you feel like you aren't um but you you have to know within yourself that you are um if if they don't want to include you in opportunities you make a way one of our, our motto at Clark Atlanta, one of our mottos is I'll find a way to make one. And that is something that I have taken with me ever since I stepped foot on that campus. Um, don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything deter you from your goals or whatever it is you want to accomplish. Um, because as Adrian mentioned, there are going to be people that aren't for you and that's okay. Right. But don't let it stop you. That's awesome, and and you know, I mean, I've actually been to a conference at Clark Atlanta. That's a really cool campus right there in the uh, in the triad with with Spelman and Morehouse. That's a that's a really cool area. So I, I'm a big fan of Clark Atlanta as well. But we're almost out of time. And and again, thank you guys so much for joining us. You guys, are, I know you guys are really busy fitness in your schedule. You guys are doing some great work, and uh, and I have no idea your backgrounds. That's a very inspirational stories. I would, we really appreciate you sharing that with our young people. And this will be seen by uh, a lot of kids later as well at all of our other high schools here in Madison County. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you guys so much again. And uh, uh, you guys, uh, uh, Monica, I'll see you in a, bit, a couple of weeks in my STEM class, but uh, <laughs> talk to you guys soon. Appreciate it again. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Right, see you. Yeah. And thanks.